tell every potential goes down to his favorite baller game. Yes, yes. And so that seemed to really escalate the problem even more. And that's when we started getting, my brother beheld a full-bodied apparition several times in our basement. We heard knockings. Most likely, you get the three knocks. That's an indication of a demonic haunt. That's how it will sometimes announce itself. A demonic haunt has to announce itself. And um, well, we're here to tell you that the existence of the demonic world is a reality and we've personally experienced it, and it does seem to be on the rise. Demonic hauntings do seem to be on the rise. And many of you, of course, who are paranormal investigators, we have, of course, Long Island with us, we have New England Paranormal, and um, by the way, I'd like to say happy birthday to Lisa of New England Paranormal. I think the closest we ever had to an expert on demonology, as far as a lay person is concerned, was Mr. Ed Warren. Does some of you remember Ed Warren and Lorraine Warren, yeah? And while we're setting up, I'd also like to um, say a little bit about uh, our friend Chris Angelo. As Brian Mann mentioned, he was a member of the Atlantic Paranormal Society. He never got to see the TV show because uh, he was killed in a car accident some months before the advent of the TV show. But uh, he was one of our best investigators. He had a background in martial arts. He was the one, if you were with the lads in the lad center, he would make sure, no matter where you were, that he would be the last one out. Nobody was left inside. He was always the first one in and the last one out. And he had an um, abnormality in his vision in that he had an abnormal number of color rods in his eyes, which enabled him to uncannily see in the dark. You go to hand him a flashlight, no, I don't need it, even up and downstairs. So I just uh, like to give a little uh, hand to, until we meet again, my good friend, Chris Angelo. Are we ready to start the presentation, Sandra? It's coming. It's coming up, good. Um, shadow people, we will go over shadow people as well. You know, Brian mentioned a little bit about shadow people and sightings of shadow people do seem to be on the rise too. And they come in various shapes and forms. Uh, you see the tall version of a shadow person that could likely be linked to the demonic, to a demonic haunt, an inhuman haunt. Okay. As we learn more and more, we realize just how complex this field has the potential to be because there are categories and divisions and subdivisions. You know, are these shadow people inhuman? Probably, but it takes about 20 minutes to define what we mean by inhuman. Are they demonic, classically demonic? Probably not. But there are crossovers, so we really don't know. And I That's know Matt, was Matt Moniz is very acquainted with shadow people and demonic haunts too, so he knows where we speak. So, are we ready to proceed, Sandra? Anytime you like, baby. All right. Stop picking on her. <laughs> Thank you. And I, she is um, just like Karen's assistant. I'm lost without Sandra, so <laughs> I will very much depend on her. Okay. Introduction. What is demonology? Demonology is the study of demons in human spirits, mostly referring to the hostile, malevolent kind of inhuman spirit. It is the study of them, their activities, their histories, their personalities. What is a demonologist? One who studies demonology and has a great deal of knowledge, always is learning more, and can hopefully use that knowledge to benefit others and help others as well as him or herself to put that to a positive practice. What led this to me to this area of study? Well, pretty much I explained it. We grew up in a haunted house and we started dealing, as our teen years went on, we started dealing with uh, the study of inhuman spirits. Most people thought we were crazy until we attended a lecture by Ed and Lorraine Warren and we realized, gee, we're not alone in this after all. And we were invited shortly after to join an organization at Rhode Island College, the first official investigation we ever belonged to. Carl and I were still teenagers. And I, this is, of course, long before the internet, so I put an ad in a local paper, believe it or not, saying we do investigations free of charge for things that are unknown. And three weeks later, we had a response which led us into our first major investigation, which turned out to be a full-blown demonic haunt. And so. three weeks later, we had even more of a reputation in our hometown. Yes. 
So talk about getting your feet wet. Our first uh, case was demonic. Okay. Ed Warren, pioneering paranormal psychic researcher and lay demonologist. It's a picture of Ed and Lorraine Warren there. Of course, we lost Ed last year. He passed away last year in August, but uh, his wife Lorraine still continues with their organization and still continues on the lecture circuit. And of course, she'll be speaking at UNIVCON 2007 coming up in October. You know, come to think of it, it almost seems uh this of our path was paved before us that we became specialized as demonologists because that first case, as Keith mentioned, was a demonic case, demonic in nature, and it wasn't too many years later. Several years later, we were involved in another big case, and that was a case of possession, which was ruled genuine. So these initial cases tended to lean towards the demonic, and that's why we were called in. Okay. Okay. A demonologist's role in paranormal investigation. Summoning demons? Well, yes, a demonologist knows how to summon demons. And there's been, of course, I don't go around telling people I work with or I mean on the street, I'm a demonologist because they'll think you conjure demons. Well, we had to get some just to take these neat pictures. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but a lot of people will, a demonologist does know how to summon demons and uh, hopefully will not use that knowledge in an unsafe way. Some things to rule out before jumping to a paranormal inhuman conclusion. <coughs> Carl, would you like to take that, since you know a lot about this matricing? Not really. No. Yes. <laughs> no, okay, uh, well, these what terms... What slide for you, Carl? <laughs> okay, yeah, I take get it. it. Well, we got it. Okay. Matricing, pareidolia, you know, simulacra, it can mean the same thing. That is your mind's tendency to impose a familiar shape or a familiar sound upon something that is relatively indistinct. An example could be drawn from seeing faces or sh shapes in clouds. Your mind will automatically do that. That's why when you see, uh, it could be blowing leaves, and, uh, some shadowy form walk by, yes, yeah, sometimes it is something of an inhuman nature, sometimes it is a classic shadow person. But when you see things move, your mind will automatically interpret that as something more familiar. The human mind does not like to say it doesn't know. It's a survival instinct, actually. Um, but that they all mean the same thing in paranormal investigation. Imposing something familiar, be it uh, auditory or olfactory or visual, on something you perceive and you really haven't decided what it is. You can't know what it is, but your mind tells you it is something that you know. That's why it's very important to stay objective when you're conducting a paranormal investigation, and particularly of a demonic nature, because your mind can play those tricks on you, and it's not something you do consciously. It's pattern recognition. Yep, pattern recognition is, is a good descriptive way to put it. It's a clinical description. Yeah, okay, think clinical. Yeah, clinical. Yeah. clinical. Clinical is a good way, I like clinical very much. Insect rodent infestations, scratching sounds, bites, rashes, etc. I know Lisa knows what I'm speaking of. We've had experience in that where um, we've gone into houses and uh, one house in particular we can think of where it was just inc an incredible infestation of uh, insects and rodents. Uh, you could just smell rat urine, mice urine as soon as you walked in. Remember the dead mouse? Uh, yes, the dead mouse, yes. Uh, uh, it was actually, a dead mouse was actually moving because not that it was any longer alive, it was so uh, filled with maggots. And uh, so Lisa, of course, she did put on gloves, she did put it on a piece of cardboard and uh, showed the client, this is what's happening, you need help here. It's, I mean, you need, we've discovered the problem, now you need to deal with it. Uh, if we're gonna help you deal with this problem, we need to charge. Yeah, well, no, no, we didn't say that. No, we but, didn't. I mean, there was a pile of lumber in the basement that was actually clicking and uh, it was almost alive itself because it was so infested with termites. But, I mean, this family, really thought that they had a demonic infestation because of things that was, and it was an elderly woman that was alone most of the time, so, I mean, but people will jump to these conclusions. So you, you want, obviously, to rule these things out first. Mold infestations, obviously very dangerous. Illness, hallucinations, etc. As you know, I, I know some people in the plumbing business. Plumbing problems and pleasant odors, etc. And, um, I mean, Jason and Grant, if they see, I mean, as, it, whether they're investigating, a paranormal situation or they're working as plumbers. If they see a serious mold problem, they won't touch it. 
they'll say you need to, you need to have this dealt with right away because we're exposing ourselves to illness. A very very serious problem that you want to try to rule out first. And once you get those mole spores in your lungs, they tend to propagate. Yes. So. Okay. <clears throat> Hypnopompic hallucinations. They occur upon waking. Hypnagogic hallucinations immediately preceding sleep. You know, some of this can go along with the old hag syndrome, the pressure on the chest. Narcolepsy, epilepsy, and mental illness. Obviously, this is very, very involved, and I'm just glossing over it, but it's things you should be aware of. Um, high electromagnetic fields can produce symptoms of temporal lobe epilepsy, such as visual, audio, auditory hallucinations, and sensing a presence, etc. You've seen that addressed on Ghost Hunters, too, where they, they check the, the wiring, and um, it's, it's really something, especially often somebody will go downstairs in the basement by the washer and dryer, they'll feel that they're being watched. Well, this is possibly one explanation for it. It doesn't rule out the paranormal, but it's, it's one but it's something to consider. Uh, particularly if you happen to be located, standing under some of the antiquated Romex cabling, that, you know, some of the wiring inside might be exposed, then you find yourself feeling that somebody's watching you, there's a presence. It may even engender an abnormality, an abnormal response in the temporal lobe. So there are all things to consider, all possibilities. The Persinger helmet is able to generate a weak electromagnetic field, and here's an experiment going on where you, hallucinations were actually engendered by this electromagnetic field, which does verify it, does tend to verify that hallucinations can be brought on, and some people are more susceptible to it than others, obviously. The Nightmare by Henry, Henry Fuseli, 1781. Typical exemplar, uh, exemplifies a nightmare where somebody is sleeping and they have the pressure on the chest. Somebody's sitting on it. And it, uh, it actually does bring about the sensation that somebody is being suffocated. Okay, okay thought form. Toronto Society for a Psychical Research creates a ghost in the early 70s. I know Carl, this is one of his specialties, the Philip experiment. Conjuring Up Philip. Yes. That was the book that was written about their experiment called Conjuring Up Philip. Yes. Group creates character history. Seance establishes contact. Philip, who didn't exist before, he was just a made-up character, answers questions through raps on the table, once for yes, twice for no. Call out the K2 meter, right? And that's, that's just a fictional illustration of Philip, and uh, he did respond, it did seem to have some intelligence. And yeah, you understand what we're saying here. This group in Toronto in the late 60s conducted an experiment to create a poltergeist or create a ghost, a thought form. Uh, they came up with a name and a history, a whole history, for this character named Philip. He lived in the 16th century. Um, he had a tragic ending. You know, they gave him a whole history. His mistress had supposedly uh, been burned at the stake and he didn't move to save her. And because of the overwhelming guilt, he threw himself off a precipice and committed suicide. But Philip never existed. They just gave him a history. And they approached this experiment as if they were trying to contact a real personality, a historic personage. So they started having seances to contact Philip. It didn't work the first or second time, but I believe it was the third or fourth experiment, experimental seance. They called on the name of Philip, asked him to contact them, then they got the raps. Boom, 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 boom. With this code, you know, was it uh, twice for yes? Uh, no, once, once for, for yes. yes, once for yes, twice for no, and Philip came through. Now, what happened there? Did they actually, by accident, contact a deceased person, an entity? Did they create it as a thought form? Was it both factors? We don't know, but they came up with Philip. Um, and they actually made the rounds of the talk show in Toronto, the talk show circuit. And, and one interview, and they demonstrated Philip rapping on the tables. In one interview, one of the researchers said, they were college students, one of the researchers said, oh, Philip, you know we just made you up anyway. Philip stopped responding. Philip didn't come back till almost a year later. They kept having to coax him back. It's as if he was offended. This is a completely true account of Philip, the ghost they created. Does Philip still exist? Who knows, maybe his batteries ran low, ran out of steam. 
but uh, that shows you can get results even if you don't have a specific object in mind. I don't know what the conclusion of their experiment was, but it was interesting. The, the general consensus is that they created... Conclusion? What was the conclusion, Sandra? <laughs> oh, well, actually, I put these, um, these slides in uh, to actually demonstrate uh, a point. Um, the thing of it is, you, you need to rule out so much before you jump to not even a, a, a demonic conclusion, not even an inhuman conclusion, but a paranormal conclusion. These, you know, when you, when you approach a client, when you approach a case, you know, this is a possibility that you're, you're going to run into, that your client has actually created the, the haunting themselves, that they've actually created this through the use of the Ouija board or, or whatever, what have you. Um, and I just wanted to uh, go back to this. This, that this is actually a, a picture of me. This, this is what happens if I try to talk during a conference, if I try to... Take the microphone away from them. This is what they do to me. So <laughs> this is why they're you're turning us in. You're writing us out here. Yeah. Nope. Sandra has nothing to say. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sandra. Yeah, but there, there is just uh, so much to consider. There's also, and, and uh, Matt would be familiar with this. Uh, it's a psychological term. It's often called transference. It's sometimes called projection, where family member, you know, I'm referring to clients, family member might have a seriously unresolved conflict. It's much easier to blame an inner conflict, an inner pressure, anxiety, on an invading entity than it is to look inside, conduct introspection, and find out what's at the root of the problem, or go to what the source in the family. Announces automatic writing, channeling, forms of possession, you be the judge. They can be, sometimes, because what are you doing when you're using a Ouija board, when you're doing a seance, when you're performing automatic writing? You're saying, all right, come in and use me as a channel. That's where the term channeling comes from. You're asking for something to take over. To a certain extent, you're surrendering your motor control, your psyche, to something that is unseen and basically unknown. You're asking it to come in, move your fingers across that planchette, and a lot of times people will actually feel something moving their fingers. Automatic writing, of course, something's taking over your motor control to write, you're inviting it in. And of course, most of the time, it's, it's your subconscious impulses doing this, but there is that chance because you are opening your psyche to something that is unknown and unseen. Of course, it's very, you know, it's different when you're collecting voices for EVP because a spirit voice is imprinting itself in that digital or that magnetic tape. I believe we have a young lady over there with yes. a hand up. Yes, yes. Well, I was just going to say, wouldn't uh, conducting EVPs be a form of divination as well? If you're it, asking for communication, you are openly asking. Well, that's an interesting question. Donna asked, is collecting EVPs a form of divination. Is that somewhat akin to a seance? What would you say, Keith? I say it can be. It can be very akin to a seance. That's why when you're collecting EVPs, you have to do it under, I'm sure Karen will tell you, you have to do it under very controlled situations. I mean, you're not going to go into a demonic haunt and say, just anybody, but he talk to me. We do take precautions before going into a situation such as this. We pray for our protection. We pray that nothing unholy will be allowed to interfere with our equipment as much as possible. We ask that nothing attack us personally or be allowed to follow us home. And we do set ourselves up into a state of grace before doing this. We do protect ourselves. So yes, EVPs can be very dangerous. And sometimes the EVP can be quite conversational. They'll actually respond to you and they'll answer a question, the rudimentary conversations, but they're actually speaking to you. I think the most disturbing thing for me about an EVP, or the only thing I've found disturbing about EVP, is when they mock you by saying what you're going to say before you say it. You play back the tape recorder and it precedes what you're saying there. Yes. That's rather disturbing. You have had some experience with that, right? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Once or twice, yes. You were saying, Don? Well, I think it's a good point to make because there's so many people that watch. You're yeah, speaking to the microphone, Don. We can't hear you. Come over. Uh, I think it's a good point to make about EVPs because there's so many people that watch the show, like Ghost Hunters, and they think, oh, great, I'm going to get a tape recorder and I'm going to try to 
catch these EVPs, but they have to perform the right protection before they do that. Because, you know, you can call in things that may not be so great during that. Yeah, that is very Donna, are you saying that these shows actually do more harm than good? What do you say? <laughs> It's just... <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me clarify here. All right, let me clarify. Let me clarify. I'm not saying that the shows do more harm than good. That What I'm saying is I think that this is a very important point to protect yourself before you go out and do EVPs. So many people think it's so exciting. They're going to get something. They're going to play it back. They're going to have EVPs. But it's important to protect yourself spiritually before you do so because things can come through that you don't want to come through. Especially in house with kids. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well spoken. So, uh, make the differentiation, though. You know, as far as uh, some of these go, the, especially the automatic riding, the the Ouija board. You're like Keith said. You're giving up your motor control. With doing an EVP and having an EVP session, you're not doing that. So that is a small differentiation that, that makes it a little bit different from from these sorts of divination. But um, they're like, I'm like, look, I don't care if you're here. I don't mind it. Just don't do that ever again. And I'm like, I don't need to see you. I'm like, I, I wasn't gonna say that you know you look like the girl from the Grudge, or like the ring or something. But I was like, I was like, I don't need to see you. So she's been, she was still there, and uh, I don't know if anybody from the first season we had the uh, Johnstone Tavern where I took the, I had the dress of the girl that got killed on the railroad tracks up in the uh, attic. Yeah. Nobody knew this, but I took it home. Oh, no way. I took it home with me just to study it, because I figure if the little girl's attached to it, I have a little girl at home. Yep. Let's see if they interact, let's see if something happens. Well, for, for a week and a half, because we did the show, we did the investigation, they did their B-roll night, and then a week later they did the reveal, so we had to bring the dress back. Within that whole week and a half, there was no noise in my apartment. No nothing, no footsteps, no giggling, no nothing. The day I brought it back, that night all hell broke loose. The girl, you could hear her giggling, she was throwing stuff, she was upset. I think I brought the little girl with me in the dress. She played with her for a week and a half. I took her away and she's pissed. So, but then luckily about a couple months later, I moved out of there, so. <laughs> she didn't follow me back, so. But uh, that was it, that was my story. That's why you don't bring anything home with you. Do you know if anybody else moved into that apartment and no, uh, actually, was advised to? Chris, the guy that run, owns the place, he actually saw something up there with me one night. I, I took him up there and I'm like, look, you got to see this stuff. Good. And he saw some stuff moving around. And uh, he's actually owns the whole place now and that's only storage up there. So, thank God. Thank down. you. Uh, anybody else? Or should I just you know, hear stories, or you want to hear a lecture, or what do you want to hear? Right. We know how fond you are of dolls. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> any experiences with the doll? Uh, well, not really. I've never had really, really an experience with dolls. Um, I just had a phobia for a long time because, you know, I've always, you know, I, you know, like not like not like the Chucky doll phobia. Like seriously, if I ever seen like something like that, I just kick it through the window. <laughs> <laughs> but you know those porcelain dolls with the real looking eyes. Well, I used to read stories when I was a kid, and like because I was the kind of kid after I had my first personal experience that I was this satanic kid in high school, in junior high and elementary school, because I would go and get all the books about ghosts and stuff. So everybody used to make fun of me, and I used to read stories about. You know, you walk into a room and these dolls will just turn their head and look at you. And I was like, hell no. I'm, there's no way. I'm like, I'm like I can't, I, I can understand, I can handle the dead. I can handle the, the ghosts. I can't handle, you know, like, you know, dolls and stuff moving toward me. Um, but that's why I've always had a phobia, but I've never had an experience with a doll. Like, we've had a couple from the show, but, you know, like the one, the one person in Virginia said she had a, a paranormal experience with a doll. Her doll would, like, wink at her and stuff. And, I saw the doll and looked at it for like a half hour mm -hmm. by myself and nothing happened, so I was like, yeah, whatever. But I think I'm over my ph ph phobia of dolls. Um, I think the reason, other than the books that I read, was Poltergeist, mm -hmm. with that clown. Mm -hmm. I, I saw that when I was like, what, eight? And I was like, yeah, that's great, thanks. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's why I have the phobia of dolls, but I've never had an experience, thank God. Anybody? Oh, hey, Keith. <laughs> Could you tell us about Precious Blood Cemetery in Woonsocket? 
<laughs> which time? <laughs> One socket wrote out. Oh, which time? Which time he said. Oh, the time over there, just general what we've experienced there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I don't know if anybody's been up to one soccer Rhode Island. Yeah. I know Donna went up there with me. Uh, Keith and Carl. Uh, Carl was there, right? Yep. Okay. Carl was there. No, Carl was there. Okay, yes. Um, you might have to tell me what the EVP said because I forgot. But, um, this cemetery, the Precious Blood Cemetery in Wonsaka, Rhode Island, is like my favorite cemetery of all time. Right in the middle of the neighborhood, right? Yeah, yeah, it's right on the right next to uh, Savini's restaurant, right next to the Blackstone Water. Um, what, when I did some research on the cemetery, and it used to be four different cemeteries, and when I think it was the first mayor when Socket died, he built this big, huge mausoleum. It looked like like Catholic Roman church pillars, mm -hmm. um, and he he, hit, he put it right smack dab in the middle of the four cemeteries, and he connected them all into one. And you can tell the ages, like. One half, like one spot's really, really old. One of them's, you know, you know, you can tell the, the, the ages of the cemeteries. And uh, I, I told Keith and Carl about this, and same time, I'm like, yeah, you guys have to check the cemetery out. It's like I can sit in there for hours and just chill. And the cool thing about the cemetery is that when the mayor was buried, he wasn't buried. He was put on a slab in his mausoleum, and one of the screens popped out of the mausoleum. You can actually see his body. You can see his skull, his neck, and his rib cage and stuff. And I think I think Keith saw it, right? Yes, Keith saw it, right? rib cage. Yeah. yeah. Um, which was kind of cool because, you know, it's like you don't get to see the stuff like that. So we went there, and uh, there, was, there was a few times I went there, caught a lot of paranormal experiences. But at one point, um, we know for a fact there's a demonic or inhuman spirit living in one of the, the back part of the cemetery. And it's always there. You can feel it when you walk into this part of the cemetery. It's like very, very like dark and evil feeling. So we saw a dead cat, and it looked like it was gutted. It looked like it was, like, sacrificed. It was like really, really bad. It was like it was like you know like the insides were removed, and, and Keith walked over and said, "Wow, a dead cat." What, what did the EVP say? When we played it back, the EVP says, "Good people, what's a dead cat?" Plain as dead. And I've had you know we had a lot of a lot of experiences there. And uh, the funny thing is, whenever you have an experience there, like trying to take pictures, it will not work. I've had experiences there where I see things moving around, you take a picture, and it's coming out black. And that's why it's my favorite cemetery. And when I heard that EVP, I'm like, finally, I can actually prove that something happens there. Every time I go there, I can't catch anything because nothing shows up on my camera. But it was a good, it was a good EVP. It was good. That was, what, four years ago? Yes. Oh, God. <laughs>